So, Mike, how did you first come into uh, the animation business? Oh, uh, well, I mean, my first passion for animation started when I was just real little, like three or four or something. And there was this, this little circus tent device with mirrors on it that you sat on a record player. Red Raven what was the name of it, and it had an animation loop on the label of it. And you could watch the tugboat in the, in the mirrors animating, and I was just... I was fascinated with this thing and look at the difference between the drawings. So I started doing my own animation, really little little flip books about this duck outwitting this guy that's trying to shoot it. And uh, uh, I just remember working on that for hours and I was just always fascinated with like that kind of like film illusion and 3D. I started doing my own 3D, you know, with a red crayon and a blue crayon and figured out how to make shit look like it was coming at you. And I, I just I just always loved that stuff. And... Um, you know, was raised on, you know, a lot of, you know, the classic cartoons that everybody knows from the 60s and 70s and just always did it no matter how much I, I thought I was going to do something, you know, legitimate with my life. People would always be, look at my doodles while I was, you know, trying to have a regular job and say, wow, you should do that. And I'd get so frustrated with them. And be like, no, I do this. I work in labor relations. And they'd be like, yeah, but that's pretty good. It's like, shut up. Yeah. So eventually, I just caved in and started doing it. Yeah. And you just went with the flow. The, the, the first, yeah. uh, the first work you were doing was a, that was back in the uh, early days of MTV. We were seeing a little bit of it there in that fantastic period of MTV Breakers. I don't know if people remember that, but they created a huge impact out here as well. Uh, the, the comedy in them was fantastic. And the, the the little MTV station ID, yeah. station IDs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, those were a lot of fun. So we we got a chance to do some of those in the in the classic period, and that was before Beavis and Butthead, right? Existed. We, yeah, yeah. And how did Beavis and Butthead come into it? Because I, I should add, Mike was director of the first seven series of Beavis and Butthead. Um, yeah, one of the directing team. There were there were four. There were two of us, and then there were four of us, and uh, and then there were five of us. But yeah, right. But yeah, that it was. Um, it was an unknown quantity. Well, what happened was we were delivering station IDs. We were delivering uh, a couple of these little, you saw little bits of clips of them here. Yep. Right? Um, my partner and I, so Baboon Animation was a, a group we had set up in the 1980s to really just throw our ideas together and, and try to get ourselves seen a little bit more. We figured we just, you know, made a bigger, you know, scarier footprint when there was four, you know, four of us shoved together so that was our concept and we could also get together weekly and just brainstorm ideas so we brainstormed a lot of ideas for MTV IDs and long story short um, there was some kind of a contest for people who were completely outside the industry and we were, we were, we were working in ink and paint which in those days really was inking and painting like yeah. really ink and really paint and um, the uh, um, contest came along and, and we just said Man, we're gonna we're gonna just bulldoze these guys. We're just gonna bury them in ideas because we figured we could submit one little idea, yeah. and maybe they'd even notice it. But if we submit seventeen ideas, they're gonna be like at least gonna know that we're out there. So we submitted seventeen ideas, and they they ended up hiring us to make three of them. So suddenly we were on the map. Suddenly we were making ideas for MTV, and people were seeing them, and that that was such a great leap forward. Um, so that, that, that idea of banding together as a collective, at that stage probably animation more than writing, am I right in that, in, in the original beginnings of Baboon, or originally, concept as well? Well, we originally put our reels together because none of us had a show reel to speak of. Yeah. I had like something I'd animated in, in my bedroom at home when I was in high school, and that was it, you know. Yeah. And I, I, a friend of mine had something, she, she came over from India, and she had got to work on some sort of like commercial for, uh, I don't know, like uh, lip balm or something like that with a, a dog in it, and it looked like a... <laughs> lip balm with a dog. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I, I didn't really understand it, but it looked like okay animation, and, you know, another friend had this, another friend had that, and pretty soon we had enough just barely to have a show reel at all, and so we just decided we're just going to call ourselves a company. And baboon animation, we just figured people would remember a baboon, so... Meant, it didn't mean any. Yeah, it didn't have a personal relationship with a baboon. Right. That's you know. good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm still young. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, 
it, it, the strategy kind of worked, and um, I don't know, just working collectively has been a lot more fun. That was the other thing. It's like, it's not that much fun to just try to make a career for just yourself, but it's a lot more fun if you get a bunch of people together and make cartoons together, because why, why else would you do it, right? Yeah, yeah, look, I'll, and we'll get to the, the idea of collaboration in writing a little bit later, but I think that's it's a really interesting thing you've set up with the boom, and um, I'd like to talk about that a little later on as well, because sure. I think it's, it's something that um, it's, it's often a lonely uh, sport, writing and um, you know certainly being able to collaborate with others is a fantastic way to approach it yeah um you, you did mention the other day just how beavis and butthead came into your life i was just wondering if you could kind of share yeah. that with us because it was really quite fantastic well it was it was re- it was kind of um it was completely unexpected because uh it didn't really it hadn't aired it didn't exist as a series um we were delivering uh uh, one of the station IDs to Abby Tukuli, who was the the producer. He was the VP at at MTV that was in charge of these IDs, and he was in charge of anything animation. And as a result, which was just these, and at the same at the time, um, so it it fell to him. Anything animation fell to him, and he just brought us into. As we were delivering, he said, "Come into our office. I want to show you something." And uh, Closed the door and he put in one of those big old three quarter inch videotape things. He had the deck under his TV and he went ka 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 And me and my partner Brian, my partner Baboon, were sitting there, and the thing starts. This is an oval and an oval, and there's a really really ugly kid drawn in this oval, and a really really ugly kid drawn in that oval, and they're looking at each other, and one's going, oh. <laughs> and the other one's going, <laughs> and they're just laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. And the tape ends. He turns on the light, he goes, so what do you think? <laughs> and my friend and I just looked at each other, we're like, well, uh, well that was pretty funny. Uh, and he's like, good, do you want to direct it? And we're like, all right, sure, why not? It was, there wasn't, we didn't, have enough information to say no if we wanted to. So, so pretty much. This yeah. kind of contradicts what we're going to go into. <laughs> <Like a minute. laughs> yeah. So, that, and that was it. So he said, "Okay, we're going to start next week." And we're like, "Great!" And he showed us Frog Baseball, which was the only existing one at the time. Um, and we're like, "Oh yeah, we get it. This is like the kids I grew up with." So, uh, um, sure, this will all work. Out. We could do this. And um, so they had made some. E- episodes already at another studio and, and Mike Judge was very unhappy with them. So uh, because the, the artist there, there was no real art direction because Mike Judge didn't know how to do that. He, he was just a guy who literally did it in his garage. He was a math teacher in, uh, down in, um, in Texas at the time. And this thing, it had been in festivals and it got a lot of attention just because it was ridiculous frog baseball. So uh, he uh, had hired a studio in New York and Westchester that just uh, threw together a bunch of these episodes, and he was really, really unhappy with them because everyone was drawing them as if a 12-year-old boy had drawn them. Because when they saw his drawings, they just, they just figured it was drawn by someone who was drawing like a 12-year-old boy. Well, Mike never really thought of his drawings as that, you know. <laughs> And uh, and uh, so he didn't really take too kindly to the way they were handling it, kind of. It, um, it's the way I remember hearing the story. So in any case, for whatever reason, they decided to just take the project in-house, and that's when they hired me and Brian. And then eventually the directors from that studio came and joined us, so we had a whole team, and we just did a, a whole lot of episodes. And the look got a little more refined, and all got into this look that, that everyone knows today. And, um, so yeah. it used to be even uglier. Well, I mean, Mike's drawings are Mike's, you know, and no one was really doing Mike like Mike wanted to be drawn, yeah. you know, and like, like the way Mike saw it in his head, no one was getting it right, you know. They thought, oh, ah, we could just draw it as if we don't freaking know how to draw and that's going to be fine. It's like, no, no, that's not what we're doing here. It's really, really specific and greatly to Mike's credit is he is, once he knew that he had to step up and be art director, which I think he learned really, really fast, He's really, really clear about what he wants and what he doesn't want. 
you know, the number of dots on the teeth and, you know, how much the nostril flares and everything. And I think it's what makes him great. I think he's super talented. I think, uh, are you guys fans of uh, Silicon Valley? Have you seen that? Super, super good show. It's and, a fantastic series. Yeah. Yeah. It hasn't got wide exposure here as yet, but it's really good. Yeah, it's worth checking out. Good, really good casting. And, uh, yeah, so it was just really, a, it was a great education in keeping a keen eye on really what you're trying to get across, which is always tricky in a collaboration, you know. You have to be super gentle in, gentle but firm, you know. You want to get your ideas very, you want to hold on to your ideas, but you also have to collaborate with people. So that's a, that art is just a lifetime of, of learning, you know. I think we can all always just get a little bit better at that as we go. And so, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to sort of move it on to um, the writing side of things. And we've got the title up there, What Makes an Animation Writer? So I just thought we might start with, you know, what are some of the key differences between writing for animation and live action as you see them? And likewise you, Patrick, for that matter. Hmm. Not big ones, not big ones in, in my experience. People might disagree with me on this, but, uh, I'll, I'll, well, I could talk about what the differences are. I, as I understand it, um, we are a lot more specific in animation cartoons with the, in animation scripts with the uh, action descriptions. Really, really specific. It's a, you know, every industry gets a culture, and in that culture, people get their own jobs, and in their jobs, they get, a, they get, have expectations about what the limits are, right? And not having written a lot for live action, but some, um, my understanding is that there's there's a point where you just step back and let the director handle the the visual vision of it. And in animation, that culture didn't, at least in the United States, that's not the way the culture works. Because you're going to hand this to storyboard artists, you want to be really, really, really specific about what you want to see on camera when. You basically want to start to direct the shots. So you give them stuff. And in animation, uh, on animation production teams, in my experience, they've been very glad that you did that extra work for them. You know, so, and, and it's really funny, this applies to um, a lot of different, there are, there, you run into these cultural things all the time, like the different, there's a difference between California and New York. How much a director, for example, in New York directs board artists is completely different than the way people uh, scribe out their territories in LA. A director has to step back and let a board artist be a director more in California. Board artists in New York are, are not used to be given that much room, and they haven't really, um, they, they won't necessarily be ready for it. If you say, just do something, they're going to be like, wait, no, no, we're expecting you to break out our shots for us. You know, and, you know, every production is different, so, you know, there's always going to be someone in New York who disagrees with that, someone in L.A. who disagrees with that. But the cultures are distinct, in my experience, anyway. In any case, when it comes to writing, animation writing, it seems always welcome and actually asked for that you that you describe your your visual actions really, really clear. You try to think visually. So if you're going to write for animation, you really want to think about the cartoon you want to see on the screen, and be really specific about you know that action sequence or that slapstick sequence. The more you can describe the action, the better. No, not every writer is really you know, built that way, they don't really think that way. And that's okay, the system can usually accommodate because, I mean, if, you're, if you have a job writing some cartoon, it's probably because you have some great strength, but it might just be witty dialogue. So really, just do what you see, but know that it, you're, you're welcome to write the visuals out. Certainly the more action descriptions there are are helpful from a director's perspective. Yeah, you, you were saying. You, you, you get the action descriptions, and even if it's something that you would change because maybe the writer isn't aware of certain aspects of the layout of the room or something like that, you get the general gist of what they're trying to do and can say, oh, okay, I, I, I know how to envisage this correctly. Yeah, because um, we don't always do our homework and look at all the design packs. And sometimes the production doesn't bother to send you the design packs. 
So you don't really know what that room looks like. Yeah. yeah so you just invent some other yeah. some other space and and yeah. um, write as if you're correct and you're just yeah. <laughs> playing out your butt. But yeah, but the more we say, the more you can Absolutely. decipher it's what we so much easier. Um, because from the outset, you can kind of see what they're trying to do, and and you know, I, I think always when I'm directing something, I've always try my hardest to sort of honor the honor the intentions of the writer and, and do what they're kind of trying to trying to trying to do. So you do adapt and you have to change things for those kinds of reasons. But if you have the script there, like the action descriptions, you really know where they were coming from. And, and also like you were saying, you know whether you have the right le- length script too. Yeah. If it's broken out, you don't wanna you want don't want it to be so vague in what you're handed in the script that it looks like, oh that's a healthy fifteen page yeah. script. But then you start to do it, and you're like, "Holy crap!" Yeah. This Chaos thing is going to be. Yeah. It's not going to be like yeah, exactly. <laughs> two seconds to just cover that bit, and then chaos ensues. Yeah, exactly. Da, da, da. Which chaos? Yeah. Tell me. Which yeah. Chaos? yeah. Um, the other the other thing I think that's that's different between writing probably from from uh, live action to animation is just from a budget point of view. You know, in live action, someone would say, oh, we've got this dinosaur that's crashing down the street and it's destroying all these buildings. And we're like, anim- and live action, they'd be like, well, that's going to cost a lot. And in animation, you're like, eh. We're like, no, that's fine. That's fine. But there's too many people talking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, we have the crowds, like, just there's too many individual people in the crowd talking. You know, I think, right. I think uh, um, Martin mentioned the other day, our animation director, he was like, just if you're going to have a crowd, it's like, have have like, just millions and have it really far away yeah, <laughs> because yeah, it becomes yeah. so much easier than, you know, don't have like 50, don't have, just have like a thousand. Yeah, it's easier, Because it becomes right? a blob, yeah. Because then, you, then blob, you can just draw yeah. little ovals on the horizon yeah, yeah, and backlight right. it so it's yeah. just black shape. Yeah. But yeah, one dinosaur is just one character. Yeah, it's, in that's animation. fine. Yeah. That's fine. And recycling <laughs> smashes and explosions, it's easy. Yeah. yeah. I think um, another thing that if folk are perhaps new to writing for animation, it's it's important that folk realise the knock-on effect of just changing a character's costume or mm. uh, a helmet or a hat or something like that. That results in a full 10-point turn needing to be created again and sometimes I think folk perhaps struggle with that um, once you get into the rhythm of it. And a lot of times the writers are not actually in contact at all with the production house and don't meet the board artist, which I think is really not a good thing at all. And only learn this by from feedback from the director going, what are you doing? You know, did you really have to put the coat on in that scene? <laughs> That's just cost a couple of grand to get the turns done again. Yeah, because um, we don't care. It's, I mean, no. it's, it's whatever. <laughs> you just write anything and, it's, and then someone else has to do it. But, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it's... Writers would always be welcome to ask more questions. Like, you don't think of doing it at the time, but it's, it's really... And, and, and sometimes the production people don't take the time to tell the writers in advance, guys, these are kind of the limits of the show. These are the ground rules. We get this many new characters. Please don't change costumes, especially if it's, uh, uh, if it's done in CG. Some of these things are... It's really expensive to rig a new character, so don't just cook up a new character. Um, what can go really wrong is a production that doesn't tell you those things early enough. And if I'm if I'm running a writing team and we're most of the way through our season and we've made it into some kind of a show and suddenly they say, oh yeah, you can no longer do any new characters, we'd be like, well, why didn't you tell us we would have used fewer characters earlier so we wouldn't be so hamstrung now. Right now we're completely stuck. It's harder for us to come up with stories because we've already used up our quota and you never told us the quota. So the more, we, so the more questions writers can ask up front, but what they can and can't do, it would be in everyone's interest. And the more the production can take the time to set the ground rules as clearly as they can possibly do in advance and also give the design pack so people know what they're supposed to be writing. The other thing that, that can pop up is... Is, is is that different writers are writing different episodes, and, and this—I mean, this actually I noticed this when we were in exchange student the series. Um, a lot of the right, you know, and writers are absolutely welcome to add incidental characters, and a lot of the stories when we got them back had most of the anime characters from the other other world were, uh, if they were human, they were usually an old man, and if they were, um, and and a lot of the rest of them were inhuman creatures, and. Um, 
that was fine for every individual episode. That was perfectly good choices. But we had a lot of episodes where we had an old man, and I was like, oh, don't want to. Care. How many old men characters can we design? So I was just like, all right, he's a frog now, and that character is uh, no longer a monster. They're now a human character, and things like that, just to try and balance it up and get a broader kind of uh, cast. You can't really do um, much about that when you're when you're. Um, in the early days, but I guess if you've got rough treatments and outlines and you, the writers can actually talk to each other, I suppose you have... Well, uh, do, you, do you have a story editor on that show that, yeah. that's, that's yeah. uh, policing all of that? Yeah, we do. Because I think your story editor came on late in the process, you yeah. were saying, right? Yeah, in that particular example, in the story, uh, he was actually based in L.A., so... He's not really running a team in the same way. He's no. more just giving comments later. Yeah, yeah. That's I, a, yes. I, I think I was just going to sort of touch on the fact that from a writer's perspective, um, there are key department heads that would, you would expect in place in America. And I just wondered if you could sort of talk to that a little bit because um, I think just map th- that's the, not always yeah. here necessarily on all productions. But just if you could sort of touch on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I could describe the the classic setup. It would affect a writer, yeah, and the writer should. Yeah, I think expecting. most of the studios work with this system, so I'll just describe a system that I think is the the usual one, and uh, I think it's developed that way because it's pretty strong and pretty lean, and also, and therefore, it's efficient to get. Mm. If you have to make fifty two episodes, you got to keep that pipeline going. It really is. It, it really is a. Um, it really is a uh, an assembly line, and if uh, things aren't all moving at the same speed with each other, it can really uh, everything can pile up, and then you don't make your deliveries on time. You know, so every everyone really ought to be doing exactly just what they need to be doing when they need to be doing it, and and it would look something like this in a typical case, in a well run case. So you would have say you had to make fifty two episodes of a show. And stop me if it gets too boring, but it's it's um, so far so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have fifty-two episodes of a show. First of all, you want to map out how long you have to do that, right? And someone has to have a really good schedule on an Excel sheet, uh, and it will, and it would normally be an overlapping schedule. Okay. So decide how many people you have. First of all, and and. Producers and whoever the whoever's running the writing services. In our case, if we're contracted to do all the writing, and, and I'm then I manage. I, I work with production to manage the calendar. We this work, is with Bebbing, yeah. Yeah, right. So company. as the head of our writing team, and, yeah. and this might all be in house on another production, whether it is or not. Mm-hmm. The head writer or the story editor. And uh, the head of production have to agree on that calendar. Um, and the way it works for any given episode is, as people probably know, there are stages. I could talk about them in a little more detail later, but basically there's premise, there's outline, there's script. Typically two drafts of each, um, if you're lucky. And if, you're, if it's running smoothly, you wouldn't need more than two drafts of each. Script, you'd have two drafts and then a polish. That's if it's really well run. If uh, where it starts to go astray is if um, your broadcaster at some point decides to come in and also wants to have a, a voice in it, then suddenly you might have to build in three drafts at every stage. So, so if you know in advance um, whether your broadcast, if you know, if, if you build that in in the first place, you're probably smart. Because a lot of times it happens that midway through, some broadcaster says, and I think this happened to you, it happened to me on my last production, which is for a Singapore company being broadcast in Germany, and Dis- Discovery Kids Asia and uh, ZDF, which is one of the big German broadcasters. Um, Discovery Kids Asia is fine with whatever we do. The guy in ZDF suddenly decided he wanted the show to go in a slightly different direction and he was going to need to look at everything. And we're like, fuck, we didn't really build that into our schedule. Luckily, we had gotten faster at our deliveries. So we could just deliver faster and give him his whole luxurious week to sip his latte and 
trash our work, you know. And it's still, we could still come out on time because, we, you know, your end date is everything. You have to feed the beast. You've got a production crew. If they sit for a week without a script, that's super expensive. So you have to make sure you've always got the next meal for the beast going. So if someone, if someone steps in in the middle, someone with a lot of power and says, I need time to... Just think about this. Then just, just on that, I, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to ask, like for an individual writer, say on an 11-minute episode in the States, yes. what sort of period of time would be Something like eight for? weeks. Eight weeks for Something an like eight weeks. That's a, that's a little tight. Yeah. Twelve would be nice. Yeah. It might okay. start with twelve. If you could, basically, if it's overlapping, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt you much. Maybe this gets too technical, but if it's overlapping so that you're still delivering one a week, if you go from an eight-week schedule to instead rethinking it as a 12-week schedule, mm -hmm. you only lose those four weeks once because mm. it's, still, it's still all overlapping. You're still going to start one the next week, and everyone gets longer, but you're, only gonna, you're not going to lose. It's not like you're adding four weeks times 52. You're yep. not. You're only adding four yep. weeks, so it's great to know that early. It's great to make your schedule too long in the start. So if you could just plan for 12 weeks for each one, but know you're really going to deliver it in eight, and know in an emergency you could deliver a script in six, because maybe you fall way behind because of this, and then at the end you got to make shit up. Like right now, we're at the end of a season of 52, and we have to deliver everything in five weeks. Right. So we started out assume, assuming 12. To stay caught up by the end, we're wailing to get them done in five, but we know the show well enough, so we're actually able to do it. Just, just to share okay. that with everyone Can here. Can anyone picture that? When I'm talking yeah, no, no, about no. That, that, that makes complete sense. I, I just think it, it's kind of interesting for Australian writers to kind of get a, a sense of um, the amount of time allowed in the US. So for an eleven, you know, it's about eight weeks for an individual, and for a twenty-two, um, about ten weeks. About ten. It's not yeah. twice as long. No. Because. Honestly, 22s are a lot easier. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? I mean, because people have a natural uh, storytelling ear they've developed. And I, and I think um, there's, a, there's a size of a story that you, your brain sort of expects. And it's a format that most things you've seen are half-hour shows of all kinds, like live action and everything. And there's a certain amount of story that you you sort of expect when you sit down and watch a cartoon. You're not really focusing on length as a viewer, right? So you want to tell that much story, um, and, it's, and if, you, if you cheap out on the story, it just doesn't feel as satisfying. You can't, at some point, stories are so short, they're just not interesting anymore, right? Um, so things fall into natural lengths. If you have, if you have silent cartoons, for example, uh, or I'm sorry, but, um, Slapstick cartoons that are main, mainly dialogue-free, like Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes stuff. There's a little bit of dialogue, but it's not dialogue-driven. The natural length for those is seven. Try to do them in five, and they just don't. You just don't. It doesn't, it doesn't escalate enough. You don't have enough room to really get it to be great. You know, you can do it. It just won't be so satisfying. Seven is a great length for those. Twenty-two is a great length for any kind of verbal storytelling, anything with dialogue in it. But if you're really, really smart, you can make those into 11s. It's a little bit harder to make those into 11s. You've got to be leaner. You've got to try to give that emotional impact. You've got to ramp up. You know, show like Steve, we've been watching a bunch of Steven Universe in the, in the coursework in the last couple of days. They're really good at packing it in. But even those, you watch a really, really good episode, and you're like, uh, it would have been nice if they could have given this emotional turning point a little more breathing room. Because there are emotions at some point... Are, are, you can't ask someone to... You're asking your audience to feel things. You're sending them on an emotional roller coaster. You can't, you can't say, hurry up and feel. You, know? you have to give them... The, there, are certain, there are just a few beats in the story. You just have to let them play at human speed. You can't accelerate it. Other things, there are techniques for accelerating. You can make a crazy chase scene faster, or you can do a montage with... You know, like commercials have been very good at exploring how to tell whole stories in very, very short period of time, and you get the whole story. It's it's really smart mm -hmm. storytelling. So there are techniques, but but basically, you want to tell a story that feels like a regular human-sized story. Mm -hmm. 
it's harder to get it down to 11. If you're given the luxury of going to 22, often it's like, oh, this is easier, not harder. Luckily, they pay you twice as much, which is great. That was my next question. Yeah, I mean, the, the tradition is that you get paid twice. Um, and and it's an additional two-way Yeah, the two secret is that, that, that that's just gets you, yeah. You can say that down here. Although it is going out on the web, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's my that's my take on it. So yeah. again, someone might disagree, but I would rather ha- I would definitely rather write twenty twos, for sure. Cool. I might just sort of push through because there's a bit to get through, and it's absolutely fantastic, Mike. Thanks. I might just jump onto uh, Bibles, pictures, and presentations. Um, for those who are creating from the ground up. Um, you hear, the, you hear the term elevator pitch used a lot, and um, well, which is basically an unsolicited pitch. Um, as an XTV executive, that was my worst nightmare. Um, is that <laughs> someone just pitches at you? Uh, does it work? Uh, y- your honest opinion, like um, I've got, I've got this great idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mice. It's just yeah. mice. <laughs> they corking mice. Nice. Yeah. Good. Give me half. <laughs> you take it and give me half of everything you make out of it. All right. Good. Thank good. You. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I. I don't. I don't know. I don't think it usually works. Yeah. Um, definitely not. It's just like going up to someone and making out with them. Yeah. It's, it's like thanks. I'll, <laughs> I'll consider it. I mean, what? You know. It's like this is what I got. It's right here. You know, it's like it, it doesn't make that much sense to me. No, but it's fine to have a conversation where I mean, and people do it because why the fuck not? When I, when am I going to be in, in an elevator with Scorsese again, right? And at least I went for it. But uh, I don't know. I I, yeah. I don't appreciate it when someone goes in it because I'm not thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a way, it's kind of the, the, the thing that's good about animation, I think, is which you can't really do in live action, is um, you can't really just shove some drawings or like a one pager under someone's nose for, for a live action. You're not really going to, but you can instantly kind of grab people's attention with a one page kind of, with some artwork that goes with some writing. And they go, and, and that, that kind of gives it a, an advantage, I think, in that sense, in that it's already pretty easy to get an idea across to someone quite easily and, and get, if you put something in front of them that way, rather than having right. to, you don't really need to accost people in elevators because... No, you, 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 you want to just... It, you? You, you, <laughs> look, everything is... So, I, so I've, I've noticed that, I don't know, I think this applies to a lot of things and I usually apply it to storytelling more, but the idea that, think of things as a romance. Think of you're trying to create a relationship. You know, you're trying to make something that's alive that you and people are making. So it is a form of, it's a situation that requires some romancing. You know, you, it, it's not, uh, and Fred Seibert, it, this, is, this is something that, as I understand it, Fred Seibert um, applies to many aspects of doing business, and, I, and if so, I, I bet it's a, a reason that it contributes to his I think it contributes to his success. And he's the guy who created... He was a uh, Nickelodeon exec, and he, he brought in uh, a lot of landmark stuff. He, uh, he's, he's the executive that, uh, that brought in uh, Fairly Odd Parents. He brought... Um, when he went independent, he brought Adventure Time to Cartoon Network. He's got a real eye. But he also has a sense of how to do business, you know. And he's a, he's like a, a big, bold personality. But he knows when to just, you know, take a couple of small, gentle steps. And what you could do in that elevator is just ask questions. Are you, uh, is there a way that I can get you a pitch? You know, say, maybe say a little bit about yourself and say, are you guys, uh, are you guys, do you take outside pitches? Just ask a polite question, you know. Just start the conversation, start the relationship the right way, you know. And so, like, the, and also, elevator pitch re- refers to being able to get your line distilled, uh, your concept distilled down to, you know, but right, kind the, of a but, couple of lines. Yes, yeah. because an elevator In pitch is a real. You you, you want to have a real condensed, ready to go pitch, not because you're going to say it in an actual elevator, because you, because that's a great exercise to really honing what works about 
your TV show or your movie or your episode. All of those things. If you can't boil it down to, as my friend, uh, I, so I was the director of DreamWorks, one of our story team, one of the guys on, on uh, our story team on Madagascar became a good friend. He's a, uh, a, a, a um, really smart storyboard artist. And he draws all of his storyboards. Everything he did on, on Madagascar and other movies. He was on Shrek 2 as well. He draws all his panels this big. This is how he storyboards. It's the strangest thing. And then he just you know, blows, scans them in, blows them up for, for doing pitches. You know, we would pitch live boards. And, I mean, full, you know, we would pitch, pitch boards with a stick, you know, which is great exercise in itself. But he would have to blow them up. And he said, I asked him why he worked that strange way. He said, if it works as a poster stamp, it works as a billboard. That's, That's exactly true with a story idea. And if it doesn't work as a poster stamp, it's going to be a, a messy billboard. It's, it's not going to be a strong story. Like a really great story, you should be able to, I mean, it really hits you. And so it, just with that, I'll move on in a sec. I mean, what, an elevator pitch where you've got your idea distilled down to what, how many lines is, is a rough guide to be able to... <clears throat> for a, sort of stro- a page. storyboard? No, no, no. No, no, no I'm for, for a springboard for, for, a, for, for an episode. For a pitch episode. or a Bible lead, yeah, yeah, just... Yeah, uh, same thing. What you would put in a pitch Bible for an episode mm-hmm. of a show, like you have a Bible that explains your show, and again, there's ways to be super brief and really punchy about that so someone can get your show. When it gets to the end, you're going to want to prove that you actually have a show that actually works by actually presenting some ideas. Maybe five, maybe eight. You don't want to do more than eight. No one's going to read them. But each yeah. one of those should only be like three or four sentences. If you can't make a compelling story with the characters that you're that you're Offering in four store in four sentences, something's wrong. Yeah. So yeah. So and and likewise, when you pitch springboards f- to the producers of a series, if you're on the series, if they don't work small, something's wrong with them. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it, it's interesting when you go to various markets, um, you know, kids screen, MIP, whatever. You do see some bibles going around where people have gone to the trouble of sort of exploring merchandise op- options in the back of it, etc. Like they become quite meaty documents. Um, I've never quite sort of understood whether that's just going to offend people because you're not an expert in merchandise yourself. You know, that's not what you do. Or uh, are people going to sort of be interested by that? Yeah, I mean, just, I, I don't, I don't think it, it, it's not so much a matter of, I and mean, we're talking about like a presentation bible, a pitch bible yes, that you would use. If you guys have ideas, you want someone to make them, right? It doesn't like in the circles we try to, or like we're doing it. You got, you guys are coming with new ideas, probably wherever, whatever circles you move in. You might have an idea for a cartoon. You would do the same thing we do. We usually present it to networks. Um, you guys would probably present them to us or whatever. However, and everybody does what they do. It should still be a similar document. It should be super easy to get, super easy to get into. Now, whether there's a whole brontosaurus behind that head, sure, that's not necessarily a bad thing. No one's going to read it if they don't, you know, if that brontosaurus doesn't have a pretty face in the first place, you know. <laughs> so make that make the face really, you know. Down at get it down to the person's level. Get them. Uh, I'm being a little bit too abstract, but the idea is <laughs> you should get that elevator pitch right at the beginning of your Bible. If you don't have one or two sentences right at the top of your damn pitch, I might not get past page one. I might be just like, I don't have time to read this now. Thanks. Uh, and then it's at the bottom of my luggage, and it just didn't happen. You know, it's not in your interest. And uh, so once you get that idea across. Direct guide people. Lead the dance with type. Use your type. Use bold type, big letters. What do newspapers do? You know, if newspapers didn't have headlines, people do pitch Bibles as if they're writing newspapers with no headlines. It's just like a million words. You haven't had your coffee. Screw it. I'm not going to read a newspaper. But if it says, U.S. goes to war with Japan, you know, that's that's a catchy log line. You know? <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's, think like that. it's quite a similar approach to how you try and do what you do with the artwork as well when you're trying to put yes. like 
for example, and, what, and that's kind of what I, was, what I meant before when I was talking about with, with animation having this advantage that you can actually, for a pitch bible, put a cover on it that's a poster that mocks, which does everything that needs to do everything that first sentence you're just talking about does, which is, right. I mean, and it's pretty advantageous being able to imagine if you can pitch a film with a with the, with the actor and get the actors in for a photo shoot and Photoshop up a beautiful poster, but you, but in animation you can actually do that. So, you can actually, yeah. Do that. So and, you, and as you know, because your your design background, it's a hierarchy of information. That's absolutely, yeah. So, do you, you want know. to describe what that means? Well, just in terms of put, putting together the, uh, much the same as you were writing, who who are the most important, the most, you know, visually uh, using visual language to just kind of just put together the most concise uh, imagery of your. That encapsulates your story. Did I just add more words yeah. in there than I needed to? But <laughs> if you know what I mean, so um, it, a hierarchy of information. I'd have, you know, if they, uh, I certainly, if they were, if they were, if it's all about a, a family that lives in a castle, I certainly wouldn't be doing a poster that had an interior of the castle in there because I want people to understand that it's a castle and that the best way to do that is the exterior of the of the of it. And so. If it's about you know uh, two kids that live in a castle, I'd probably think about putting them on the moat out the front of the castle and having the castle the clearly by, center, right. right behind them, and maybe or maybe incorporating the castle into the logo and things like that. The most important pieces of the story, and putting getting them visually into it. And I mean, it's pretty. It's it's a great combination that you can pitch things like that for animation, where you can have. The visuals and the text like that. Together. It's like medieval painting did that, right? Like everybody, yeah. like, like the scale wasn't according to like actual mathematical perspective. In medieval painting, they would do things in the scale of importance. So Jesus mm-hmm. would always be big. The saints would be medium size, and other people would just be small, and it would look like not correct. But in terms of what's important, it was absolutely correct. It's your headline, your sub headline, and then. Your text. Yeah. So Bibles should work that way too. Posters should work that way. Really, your your the way you lay out your scenes in the actual animated cartoon should work that way too. Everything. Just think in terms of exactly most important. What else is important and what's not important. Cool. Um, and you know, look, I think you're quite right. One of the advantages with animation is a two page. You can take you a lot lot further than um, is possible in live action for sure. And we've been taken to doing this thing where we kind of have a a form of a two-pager up front, and then we do have the whole brontosaurus body in there for those that want to know more. If, if they're hooked and they want to go, oh, yeah, so let me just dig a little bit deeper. It's all just right there ready for them. So you can just, yeah, it, it, it's nice. We've been doing like a, even in the full Bibles, if, people, if a client wants it, we develop these, we develop shows for other production studios like you guys in, in various countries they come in with their idea and we make a presentation for them we've been doing like a cheat sheet right up front like each character just a one liner about each character and then you can go back in later halfway through the bible you can have a whole half page about each character that's one yeah. way to do it, but it's nice. If you're doing that in animation, probably what you got with, with uh, Beavis and Butthead just standing there laughing at each other was probably a pretty good Exactly. Thing. Yeah. It, like, it basically <laughs> said a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'd just like to move on to uh, series writing. Um, and just look, first up, it, 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 the difference between, uh, difference between hook and theme, I mean, there's a lot in that, but just in a basic sort of sum up what does that mean to you um, they're not the same idea um, they're um, they're both very important but they are, but they can be like you could apply the, the theme is sort of like it's something like the lesson mm-hmm. and the hook is um, is more something like the gimmick Right, you can see that a gimmick and a lesson don't seem like the same thing at all. And 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 uh, you know, like the uh, the hook is like the high concept uh, of it. It's Schwarzenegger, and he's pregnant. You know, like that's not the message of the movie. The message is not don't get is not get Schwarzenegger pregnant. It's probably a bad idea. Like if that's what you get from it, don't try to do it. 
Um, the, the message is what I didn't watch the freaking movie, but maybe it's the great. message is pro, what's that? That's great, is it? <laughs> I like it. What that? What's the name of that movie? Junior. Junior. Yeah. I want to watch it tonight now. But. I just love it because every Arnie film at some point has him going, oh, 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 and he gives birth in this one, so it's perfect. <laughs> I just want it out of my body. <laughs> on that note. On that note. <laughs> I was just going to ask you about tropes. <laughs> What's that? Uh, tropes, classic tropes. Oh, tropes. And, and just explain if tropes you are wouldn't fun. mind a little bit about what that is and, yeah. and whether, whether that's useful. I mean, they're on the internet. You know, most people here would be familiar with that. But just a little explanation and whether you yeah. use them yourself. Or... It's, yeah, I definitely use them all the time. Um, it's sort of like, you know, in, in the days of uh, drawing with manual tools... You know that set of things they call French curves? It's like a go-to tool that, that helps you draw really really nice S curves and things like that. You just keep it handy. Tropes are kind of like that. It's a tool to keep by your side when you're trying to generate stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, all it means is they're, they're kind of the classic kind of story ideas that you, you've, you've seen in one form or another that can you, you can sort of reuse them in different environments like so many kinds of series and movies and um, oh, probably even legends uh, use, use something like two characters stuck that don't belong together stuck together and they both have to solve a problem together. Um, or a famous one, The Prince and the Pauper, right? That's a trope. That's like, that's the movie Trading Places. You know, that's all kinds of... Um, and the other one is like the amnesia one, where you're someone you got a comfortable life, suddenly you get hit on the head and you end up somewhere else. There, you know, a form of that is, uh, I mean, you know, and there, there's also like the King Arthur, you know, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. You know, that's Planet of the Apes. You know, it's it's someone that we're familiar with their world and their technology find themselves in some other world that that is somehow related to ours, but they're, they come from a, usually a more advanced time and they have to, f they have to, but they're completely at a disadvantage. So, yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, these are, these are three ideas. Yeah, yeah, no, they're good examples. And there are literally hundreds upon hundreds. There are hundreds and hundreds the of them, yeah. and they're all good story ideas that might work for your series, so just consider them. You Maybe might. just change the end if you're looking at legends and <laughs> tales, because usually yeah. you'll find it's always just, and everyone died. Right, they right. died. Yeah. A little moment, she died. Yeah. At the end, there's little Russian children. And then what happened? They went, and then, they, and then she died. <laughs> she died. Always, <laughs> everyone died. Right, right. The children, they had the poison, they died. Go yeah. to bed. <laughs> and they all starved to death. Yeah. <laughs> Sleeping now. <laughs> so in a long-running series, I'd just like to touch on what, do you, what does a character need to possess to be able to run for you know 52 episodes? You, and the other day you mentioned, I think it's Boyd's, that sort of there is that famous example of early computer technology where um, yeah. it was programmed. But it would be nice if you could share that and your thoughts on what you need to keep that character moving and interesting for that. Okay, so this was, if I can see if I can, how quickly I can summarize this idea. This was something I first learned about in this documentary by Errol Morris called Fast, Cheap and Out of Control. Has anyone ever seen this documentary? So he talks, uh, at one point he talks about um, a very early experiment in robotics, which was, because a big question in robotics is, well, is it alive or is it not alive? And one of the tests for whether a robotic thing or, or a cybernetic entity is alive is if it has its own motivations, right? Does, is, it mo you know, is it motivated to move forward in the world, feed itself, and, and reproduce, things like that. Does it want to keep itself alive, right? So they created, this, they created this, and so I started thinking, well, that's like, it, and, and it is like people, like that's, I mean, we are, we're creatures moving forward. We're programmed to want things, and those things move us forward in life. We're programmed to get hungry and get food, you know, find relationships and make babies out of that, and you know. Um, none of this is our idea, you know. I'm not attracted to, you know, when I was 17, 15, 
13, whatever, I, I suddenly was, I suddenly wanted to have a girlfriend. I never wanted that. It just happened to me. I was programmed to want things. Anyway, what if you program, so with, they created this computer simulation, simulation, and they said, what's the simplest, they just wanted to see what would happen if they created a bunch of uh, entities. Let's say they're characters. They're all exactly uh, the same. They kept it super simple. They were little triangles because computer graphics were simple in those days. But they were birds. They were like birdoids, like humanoids. And they called them boids. So the experiment is called boids. And boids is just little triangles uh, on a screen, right? And they made, I don't know, 40 of them or something like that. And they, they gave them three motivations, three simple motivations. They want to move forward. So these triangles would move you know, in whatever direction you pointed them to start out. They would want to move forward, right? They would want to not crash into each other, and they would not want to be too far from each other. I'm like, yeah, that covers a lot in terms of human experience, right? We want to move forward. We want to be with each other, but we don't want to crash into each other. Um, and uh, then they set those 40 things going, just to hit start, and they, and they started moving, and they formed the most complex, beautiful patterns, right? It was, it was an incredible kaleidoscope of, you know, it's like a flock of birds moving in the most incredible complex um, dynamics, which again, look at how complex our life is. But maybe all of our motivations are dead simple. So what if when you get to cartoons, you make the characters' motivations dead simple? Don't do two pages of backstory. Don't do, um, don't say, don't describe a million aspects of that person. Think of three things they want. Just what three things does your character want, you know? And so we did this in, in class this week. We took uh, um, uh, Steven Universe, and we looked at each of those characters, and, and, and we were testing whether the stories that they told on that, on that show were based in some very simple motivations of ca those characters, and sure enough, they were. That's a really well, I would say, engineered show that's a... You know, whatever. It's a really well thought out show. And what development, the really good development executives really purify, really purify their work to do just this. This is what, this is what we boil it down to. Uh, and this is what the, the, the buyers and the pe people like Curtis Lalash at Cartoon Network, he knows to look for these little things. Are, there, are they strong, clear characters with very clear and relatable motivations? that separate from each other in an interesting enough way that if I started to put them together in my head, oh, stories start to happen that are complex and rich, but also always relatable. That's exactly what you want to go for. So we broke it down. It's like, um, do people, how many people know Steven Universe? Okay, so I won't get to in, in too much detail about it, but Steven Universe, and, and you, have, you kind of have to think about it, and there's no right answer. You know, but we could we could sort of figure out from what we were watching what Steven Universe, for example, wanted. Steven Universe, who's like the fourth uh, in a team of superhero women, because he's the son of one of them that died. So there's this uh, missing superhero, but she had a she had a kind of a like a fun loving idiot son. He joins the team, right? So it's like, um, uh, and but he really wants to still be kid like, right? really important for him. Like, he's full of life and imagination and just stupid kid fun. He wants to have kid fun, one. He wants to be taken seriously by the team, right? So those things are naturally, he's got conflict in himself right there. He really wants to be a useful part of the team, right? And I guess we said the third thing was uh, he really wants them to succeed. He wants to be appreciated by the team, and, and of course, he has the goals that they have, which is to save the world or whatever it is that episode, right? So those three things are plenty, you know, and then we said, did the same for the other three characters, and then we saw that in one of them, one character really just is sort of a John Belushi, right? Sort of like this, this kind of a bruiser of a woman, and, and she just, she's got to just get physical. She just really wants to get physical, and another one is more of a... Um, uh, kind of a do things by the books type and also is much more mothering so he's always looking 
out for other people, right? So wants to keep an eye on everybody, but also wants to analyze things, but also wants to, uh, you know, I guess wants the team to succeed. I'm trying to remember exactly what our what we boiled it down to, but it makes a very rich character because if you're being, it, you know, if your way of solving problems is you want to think it through, you're going to act a certain way when faced with a problem. You're going to want to think it through. The other one, the the the, the more um, id-like character, the more of a bruiser uh, uh, chick, ameth- amethyst. She wants to just solve it by diving in, right? And that means they're going to be a conflict. They both want the same goal, but they want to get to use what they do to, to solve it. All of a sudden, you have all kinds of interesting stories. So there was one story where, where Amethyst wanted to get physical. She had to have this wrestling career on the side just because she was being so you know, kept down by the team who wants her to behave like a, like a, um, a crystal gem. You know, these guys are called the crystal gems. And so she had to have this secret life on the side just to get her shit out. She really wanted that. And when they found out, there was conflict. So, so basically with that... The stories tell themselves. It's so much with, easier with to tell stories. a simple construct of, yeah. of, of three key, or a limited number of yeah. uh, drivers behind the character. I think that's a really, really fascinating point. You will, you, it will be so much easier for everyone on your team to find stories to tell. If, if the characters have three strong desires. Uh, and I was going to say... Or whatever, sure, something like that. It, it would, would it not also be easier to understand how to write the show in a p- particular scenario, how to write those characters, because yeah. you know how they're going to react exactly. in, those, in those situations? Yes. And, it's, and for fans of the show, you can't become a fan of the show unless you can really like latch onto and relate to... Mm. Oh yeah, I feel just like her. Mm-hmm. Or sh- that reminds me of my friend who's always like that too. And you start to love the characters. Mm. You love like honing those, sim- like simplifying that actually makes you love the characters more. Mm. I started to get a kick out of it when we when we're going when we're you know getting a few episodes down the line and people are starting to say oh, he he would do this there or he would and you know that other people who are working on the show just go oh that that particular character would do this in that situation mm-hmm. and you laugh and it becomes funny because you know that's who they are and then I go all right our characters are starting they've got something you know yeah. it means they've got something there they you know who they are yeah exactly i might just push it along a little bit there folks I'm, i was just going to jump through the business and culture of the industry as it sort of plays out in the states um the uh, you, you make a note there that the Hollywood creative culture of criticism through encouragement. Um, I'd like to raise that one where the, the meeting has to be positive, I suppose, which is decidedly un-Australian. I'd like to kind of <laughs> explore that a little I bit. I don't know, more. you guys are, everyone work? is so nice and, and polite and gracious here. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I got. I mean, yeah. <laughs> No, but that, that idea, and I believe Pixar do it, and uh, yeah, I, I think DreamWorks do, but it, where within the meeting you're not to comment negatively. It, everything has to be a yes and rather it's, than a no it, but it, kind it's of a, thing. It's a form of diplomacy that, I mean, some, someone literally at DreamWorks coached me in this when I first got there. You know, I think I just was too um, uh, frank with my opinions uh, you know, I just had creative ideas and I would say them. In, in New York, no problem. I wasn't unusual. You know, in California, someone took me aside at one point and said, you know what? This isn't really a no but culture. It's a yes and culture. I'm like, wow, you really laid that out for me. I'm not really sure I'm comfortable with this. It took some getting used to, but I started to appreciate the value of that. Um, it's a matter of not negating what's... Because everyone's working hard. Right? Everybody is trying their best. They really are. It's really easy to forget that if someone is presenting stuff that is going to conflict with something that you believe, like you're working on a movie, right? So when we were, we were working on a story in Madagascar, there were different ways you could tell the story. And people would get great ideas in their head. You know, and everyone's talented, so everyone's going to have pretty damn good ideas. Um, they can't all exist, you know? So how to find the way to hear everyone else's idea and suggest an alternative 
is really, that's one of those things that takes practice. And one of those things that affirms the other people's hard work too. And that's kind of what yes, yes and is about. It can be taken to an absurd degree where you say yes and exactly the opposite of what you just said. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I was at wondering that, about At it. that point, it gets a little Alice in Wonderland. But, yeah. um, y- you know, whatever. Used with some intelligence, it's much better than no but. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, just just quickly, like when you're at DreamWorks, what, what would the writer's room look like, look like and kind of consist of on, on one of those big features? So the way it works is... There's an idea that gets developed and outlined by you, usually, assuming, and most of the projects do come from in house. Usually, there's someone independent. Like for a lot of my time there, I was working independently in the, with a development team. I wasn't on an assigned film, right? So while I was not assigned, I would earn my paycheck, hopefully, by showing up every day and thinking of stories that could turn into movies for them, right? So, and, and I had a, there was another, DreamWorks director that I became partners with in this. We just formed an alliance. I don't think we were assigned to work together, um, or maybe we were, but in any case, it kind of evolved that we would we would work to try to develop movies. So, and one of the movies we developed the story for was Monsters vs. Aliens, which was based on a property they had optioned um, called uh, Rex Havoc. So we we found this in a drawer of shit they had optioned, and we started to develop it into a story. Now, if that had gotten any wings or legs or whatever you want to call it while I was there, which it didn't, it would have at some point gone to a screenwriter who wouldn't be us, because we didn't really, we weren't those guys, you know. Um, If it had taken and it had come back to us as, as the directors, it would have been after the screenplay was written. Okay, so normally... It goes out to some screenwriters. Uh, um, the two guys that wrote the original draft of Madagascar, um, Billy Frolic and... Uh, and uh, oh, shit, I'm spacing on the first guy. They, they brought it back, and, and it started to get made by a team. They put together a story team, which in animated feature world means storyboard team. And those story artists are storytellers, as opposed to in New York, storyboard artists are often more executing a, a vision that's given to them. These story artists, much in the original, because I think it came from the original tradition of Disney, where, for example, Snow White it did, and Warner Brothers as well. It was yeah, good. those story teams would ta- those storyboard teams would be creating the story. So we would then take the script and think of it in sequences, give those sequences to individual uh, board artists who would then envision that story and there'd be a lot of freedom for them to make that make that story it's an important story beat right and that would they have to make that sing then when it's put all together in a reel you start thinking well you can kind of see it but is it all working someone might say we really need to then the whole thing starts to change the original script that you wrote um, has to be constantly reconformed, you know, and sometimes because the story is being driven yeah. by the the, the board yes. artists. Yeah. So I was an interim director on that project. So me and Eric Darnell would direct together, and sometimes we'd sit late after the day, and then we'd rethink or we'd rewrite a scene from that script, and then that would go to a board artist, or sometimes a board artist, or sometimes we just we would have these discussions with the whole, all the board team and us, and the head of story is the head of the storyboard team, but he's really a story specialist as much as he is a, a storyboarding specialist. And the conversations would largely be the three of us and Murray, uh, sorry, was the producer. And story artists would, would chip in when they had ideas, but it would be a creative conversation of us four plus all the storyboard artists would be there with us. And we'd rethink some section of the film. Then that section of the film would go to Rob Koo or whoever the storyboard artist was to re-envision it. And then a few, you know, whatever period later, a week, two weeks later, we'd get it back and we'd plop it in and then we'll see what else changed. So at some point, it became a lot of moving targets and, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's the most efficient way to tell stories. It, 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 it certainly takes years to make films for, to get, every, you, you imagine all the moving parts in this and to really see what you're writing. It always felt to me a little bit unwieldy. 
And for, for my money, I would spend a lot more time, and I have since, in the outline phase before you even go to script. I think it's so much more, you can be so much more nimble if you take an eight page outline, which really is like, it, you can, you, it can be such and, a. And what, sorry, and apply that to uh, before, the board artists. Before, that, yeah. before a board artist is yeah. ever hired, before a screenwriter is ever hired, mm -hmm. just take that core creative team and beat the shit out of that outline until no one can find anything to critique about it. You know, pass it around. People, it's more, it's easier for other people to read if you want to hand it out to people to get their feedback. That's the length that I believe is going to be your your best ally if if you don't have huge budgets, especially. So if you're trying to work indie. And you, and you don't have fifty million dollars or a hundred million dollars to make a movie. A lot of that time was a lot of that budget was spent in the years of boarding and reboarding. Um, mm. I, I, I think uh, I think outline is going to be a smart place to, to take. So it would make some of those. Cases. It almost went straight to a finished script, and then it was all being picked apart from there. Yeah, it went from outline to script, but that outline still. Could have been could have been tightened up. Yeah, like I know what they what they started with on the outline to Shrek Two. I was asked to do a consultation on it, and that's what got me the job at DreamWorks. So, um, that outline was when I got it, it was still pretty loose, and it wasn't long after that. And you know, I made my comments, and a lot of people did. It wasn't long after that that they went to script on it. Um, um, on some movies, I, I, not necessarily, I, I don't know much about scripts, Shrek 2, where it went to after that. But I just know that for, for me, it feels really satisfying to really lock down, find everything wrong with your outline before you start mm. doing the more expensive steps. Mm, sure. I'd, I'd just like to jump in there with a quick, quick comment. Um, a lot of the contemporary shows that are coming out from uh, a number of companies, but particularly shows like. Uh, Regular show, even Adventure Time. Those yeah. those programs are, are, are proudly sort of saying it's it's actually storyboard driven as opposed to a traditional writing model. I'm never quite sure how that you know, how much truth there is to that. I mean, I know there are still writers involved, and I think perhaps yeah. a, a lot of the board artists themselves are, are writers. Perhaps. Maybe I, 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 I don't yeah. know the specifics of those particular shows. Yeah. Um, it's just a term that you, you hear, and we certainly hear quite yeah. a lot. And it's interesting the way that you sort of break it down into a film model where that is almost happening separate to the script, which is kind of what strikes me as odd. Well, here's what I, I see. I don't think board-driven usually means exactly as pure an idea as, as it suggests. Yeah. Because shows that are board-driven often first have a writer do an outline. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great sort of hybrid board-driven show. And I think that's why some people, because there's a demand for really rich storytelling now. You know, that it's, it's not like just, I mean, as much as you love Bugs Bunny or, you know, Sylvester and Tweety, it's uh, not about the dialogue. You know, it's not about characters relating in a very complex way at all. The beauty is it, its simplicity, but... You know the scripts aren't aren't much compared to the boards. All the richness happens in the, in the boards. It, 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 but no, but I just want to say yeah. so. These shows would I, so some shows often start with writers writing detailed outlines. So again, it's all mm. about that outline. It makes sense. You read it like a story that works, and then you give that to the board artists. And then in, instead of going to script, you could, you like SpongeBob. You would you would write the, the writers wrote outlines. Then it went to the board artists who'd make it rich and add more hilarity, add more gags. Yes. And then there would be just a record script made later. There wouldn't never be a script actually written that would look like a regular script with the action and stuff. Uh, you yeah. don't need it. Yeah, yeah. There's outline, there's boards, and then there's for, um, dialogue for recording. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's what they kind of usually call board-driven today, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I mean, I've certainly asked a lot of questions about this going because I, uh, as a board artist, I was like, oh, now we're writing it as well all the time. <laughs> you know, uh, are we? And, and I went into it and, and um, into the Cartoon Network offices and I saw this, where the, all the board-driven stuff was going on. 
I've since been, I've been prying about this for a long time, and I've since kind of found there's a lot more writing going on. There is there is an yeah, outline usually board, being yeah, written. Yeah, storyboard is not the medium to tell the, stories. Yeah, and I I agree with that. It's, not since not since the old days. You know, in the old days it was it was true, and there's a tradition of that. So people I think romanticize that. But you really need to write your outline first. I I, I think if you yeah, really I think want you to need to be the for, to, the for today's style and standards. Yeah. Yep. But I can definitely understand uh, where visuals can drive uh, dialogue back again, and where where the sort of the visual humor can start to inform the dialogue rather than the oh, other way around, and sure. start to you know show like Adventure Time. Definitely, I mean the, the dialogue is written obviously after they decided to have some of these bizarre ideas of, of yeah. And SpongeBob, SpongeBob is very dialogue heavy. We do analysis sometimes of how many words are in a script. And for a board-driven show, it's got a hell of a lot of dialogue. Mm. So mm. someone's got to write that, and they've got to write it at yeah. some point. Yeah. You know, it's usually written after the board. Yeah. Or, you know, some of it is suggested in the outline. Yeah. But only, you would just put it in quotes in the outline, mm. you know. But eventually, you're going to, I mean, you've got a, mm. a, a typical number, of, like 140 lines in a, mm. in a SpongeBob episode, just as if you had started with the script. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I think, I think definitely with animation, the... the no matter how you do it, that at some stage that going from writing to, to boards and then actually going back to writing and writing, doing some re, re, rewriting after that is always how you're going to get your kind of yeah your best yeah show. for sure. And by the way, the board artists can come up with that dialogue for their own yeah. sequence. Yeah, that's probably what happens a lot on SpongeBob. I'm not I'm not really sure. But that you would you would just draw your panels and you would just write the funny mm. line underneath of it that you thought of mm. and when you're coming when you're yeah. boarding that sequence. We certainly often just drop drop in shorter dialogue, but then occasionally there's a moment where you're like, oh, with you know this idea or this moment here would work better if that someone needs to have some you know uh, some meteor dialogue there to say uh, for this gag to work, and you know I can kind of make something up, but. I think a writer's going to come up with some better dialogue here that, that's stronger. Yeah, that so then you decide to kick it back to a writer to yeah. cook up, to really refine those lines. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I, I think it's a really interesting um, partnership between board artist and writer at that story development stage, and I don't know whether many folk have had the opportunity to work that way. Um, I don't believe it is as close a relationship on most productions in Australia as it would be fantastic if it, if it was, and certainly that's what... Part of what we're doing um, as part of Enterprise Stories is certainly trying to join those two together um, because it is a potent mix, I think. It's um, yeah. a really fantastic and efficient way of moving forward. I'm just going to jump ahead just a little bit because we're ticking, the time's ticking away. Um, the animation business is becoming way more international now, and I know that you know, at Europe markets all the time. We've worked in a number of different territories outside of the U.S., um, and we sort of touched on it the other day, just some of the sensitivities that come into creating a product that's going to go and be played to a number of different cultures and in different languages. And there's a few do's and don'ts along the way. Um, and it can come back the other way as well. Like you had the interesting job of effectively not just rewriting the dialogue on a Russian series, but actually rewriting the story to pre-existing show. Yeah, that's. Do you want to just share that a little bit? Other that was oh quite gosh, extraordinary, that was crazy hard jobs. But uh, occasionally we've been given a, a film that the story didn't really add up for us, and we were asked to make it work for an American distributor, and we we, we would just turn the sound off and and watch it, and we would figure out if we could find a, a, a more soft. For example, first of all. It's times like that when you go back to a guiding question like, what's the theme? And the theme of your of uh, your movie might be something like a lesson like, um, you know, there's no place like home. You know, as, as much as you're tempted, or the grass is always greener. You know, in there's, these, you, could, you could make your whole movie be a, sort of a, a treatise on that idea. You know, something like Finding Nemo. You have to let go of your kids, right? That's a that's such a rich theme. It's such a simple statement. You know, it's li- you know a minute to say a lifetime to succeed at, or a whole hopefully a whole movie to succeed at, right? So we tried to find a theme for that that particular movie uh, 
to guide all our writing. And then we would try to find the funniest way. I mean, you've got characters on screen, and this one's saying something, and this one's saying something. Um, you can often just find a whole different... Like, in a couple of cases, some of the scenes were just a completely different idea. And in some, you just change a couple of sentences, and it lets your theme track through the whole movie. You know, you know. I wonder if we were right leaving the island. You know, you can just have slip that in there somewhere. So you remember, you track it back to your theme, but you have some sort of a guiding light. You know, and th- and that's kind of how we approached it. And then we just I, tried you to said make it bizarrely, funny. it wasn't that difficult or exp- uh, that sort well, of hard like job, a, but but not impossible to actually do that. But I mean, not impossible it's because rare, you just have to take it a, too, I'm sure. You just take it ten seconds at a time, and you know, it's a lot of ten seconds. But you, but really, it's like a lot of things in animation. You know. It's like it just seems like a giant job, but mm. just think about that little bit that's right in front of you and try to make it great. And mm. once you've got ten of those stacked up, you're like, "All right, I think we can do this." It's an incredibly rewarding moment when you realize that you might just pull off retooling something that's already there. I think it's like I always get a kick out of it. Right, because you've had you you've had to do something similar. Mm. Um, just with the the market sort of expanding right right out through a lot of non-English speaking territories as well. Uh, there's, you know, that, is there a bit of a danger that you know, a product can kind of just get blanded out as it tries to satisfy too many sensibilities along the way? Or you know, classic stories just sort of make their way through that anyway? I think they do. I think mm. human emotions are universal. Like the stuff that we've been talking about, it's not like that's not true in Uzbekistan, you know. It's people are people, and, yeah. and so yeah, just really rely on that. You know, don't make it too cool for school, and not and, you know, if it's about substance, it's about human substance and human interaction. That's universal. Just don't do poop jokes in Russia and things like that. That that's they, not they good. There. Do not like you know, and don't do like we're puns. big on them here. Don't do puns that won't that no one can translate because you know a lot of times if you're working internationally, the goal is to have. Uh, translated into ten or, or twenty languages, or even just three, you you know, you're asking too much for someone who's paid too little to kind of find a pun to replace it in their language, and they just won't. You know, they just won't. It'll just be like people are saying boring things for like they just take your joke out, and put something normal there, and it's just like a dead spot. So if you want it to translate well, don't give them something to not bother with. You know, so. Don't try not to do puns, you know, and learn what you can about the culture. You're, you know, usually you'll get some pushback, or someone will tell you, yeah, just don't do this and don't do that, or make it this style of humor, you know, whatever. Hopefully, you'll get some information before you start. But yeah, the kind of Holy Grail is very much um, non-dialogue driven um, content. That's, that's, that's always comedy. a good bet. Yeah, if you can make right non, non, the yeah dialogue-free comedy, of course. Yeah, like Oggy and the Roaches or something like that's one of the most valuable properties out there at the minute. And uh, for, because it's not based on dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Tom and Jerry, believe it or not, is still Cartoon Network Asia right through the region. Their number one show, which is kind of depressing in some ways, but <laughs> <laughs> but not non-dialogue driven for people wanting to write. If you can write action and do non-dialogue. Dependent, uh, funny cartoons. Yeah, it's, like some um, people come to writing from uh, directing, storyboarding, and other animating things like that. And those guys and girls tend to do really well at being able to write visually. Mm. So, but it, it definitely, like you're saying, help, helps to know know your audience. I mean, I, I'm, I doubt Peppa Pig is very popular in the Middle East and things like that because they don't eat pigs, you know, and, and or, or they might not like pigs particularly. I know that, like, certain yeah, cultures don't like particular animals. We we think they're quite nice little things. And in other cultures, some of the, you know, people that might yeah. be like, they're like, rabbits are fucking disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, we don't want to have a show about that. So Eastern Europe loves hedgehogs so much that, like, kids clamor to get a hedgehog-shaped cake for their birthday. I, I have no understanding of this. Well, they love hedgehogs. <laughs> yeah, you can't go wrong with a hedgehog in, 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 Eastern, in Europe. Eastern Europe. Okay. Yeah. Hey, look, I might just jump on to feature storytelling because um, I'm not sure how is the time. Then? Got that? Uh, I'm not going to see that far for about four years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay, we'll jump through. I just want to get on to feature storytelling. Um, 
And you were, you were quoting the uh, four quadrant strategy that's employed by uh, well by DreamWorks, I believe. Yeah, yeah by, by all the all the people making expensive family features. Yeah, can you want to just talk to that a little bit? Just explain what that is and and kind of why it's there. Yes, um, I mean. The idea, what four quadrant storytelling means is basically mother, father, sister, brother. Uh, like four, uh, all, you know, all the members of a household. And if you're making family films, um, you know, you can make them more edgy for adults or more kiddie for kids. But you want to be careful who you, to include all four groups. And um, the reasons are kind of financial. Like, you know, it's not just altruism. It's if you're making an expensive movie... Do you want only young girls to like it? Um, you're not going to... Who's Basically, who's got the keys to the car? Your parents. You're going to really do better if they like it too, right? And if there's not going to be an argument between seeing this movie and that movie, between the girls in the family and the boys in the family, you're way better off. So if, you, if it has female appeal, if it has male appeal, you've hit everybody, and they can all agree to go see that movie, and four people... You know, as uh, Samuel Goldwyn famously said, what's this movie about? I think he said it to William Faulkner, who said, you know, what, what are movies about? William Faulkner, it's about finding some expression of the soul. He said, no, it's asses in seats. So, and, and, you know, he's, he's a businessman. He had a film, like, that's what he, you know, as crass, you couldn't say it more crass probably, but the, the fact is he had to fill theaters to stay in business. And so do we, we all, really. We're making our stuff to succeed and that also means it's got to succeed financially um, there's you know there's just no two ways around it so four quadrant just means think of the ways that it'll succeed financially now if you want to if you have a real niche film don't try to turn it into a family film just try to do it for a quarter of the budget you, you were making a point uh, the other day there that a family movie isn't just about getting you know, the, the family, family to, get there. to watch it it's well that's more the that's a, a, a beautiful secret that someone once um, said to me. Um, the idea that family movies aren't just for families in this four quadrant thing, they're about families. And they're usually, usually about reuniting a somehow broken family. And if you think about it, wow, it really works often. Finding Nemo, obviously. Uh, the Incredibles, obviously, Shrek's a little harder to make that argument with. Um, it, it, it's so it's so appealing to families to see a family fix itself, um, and it, it drives so many so family so many family movies. It's just a great idea. Mm. And, you know, really it could be a surrogate family. You know, it could be Toy mm. Story is the same. Toy Story is a family. Yeah, exactly. Now, as we're time's ticking away, I just—I I know that you're a big believer in the first minute, fifteen minutes in a film, and you had quite a few thoughts on that. And I think, yeah, we don't have time to show any, but I, I just yeah. think, wouldn't mind you just sort of talking through kind of the importance of those first that first act. Well, these are—I mean, really—and um, this is true of any length. If we say the first fifteen minutes. You know, and maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's 25, hopefully it's not more than that, but the first few minutes of your movie are your first chess moves, right? If, you're, if your goal, if what you're trying to win is the audience's heart or whatever, you know, you have to carefully plot your moves so that you get the audience to invest. Are you coming up with a protagonist that they can actually care for enough to start to live vicariously through, and are you giving them a problem that they can root for, right? Are, and you have to careful, and you have to do it quickly, because people are going to tune out in in those first fifteen minutes if they haven't found something to invest in. You know, if they haven't go, oh God, he's got a big problem. I, I really want to see how this turns out. You know, or oh, my God, look what happened to her. How is she going to survive this? You know, if you, don't, if you don't do that in the first, you know, whatever, 15-ish minutes, someone's just going to not get engaged. So um, that, that's kind of what that's about. So if you look at the first few minutes of any good movie, almost every line in there of dialogue, almost everything you see, 
is playing a double role. It might be for laughs. It might have a great action sequence to, to hook you, which is another technique to kind of go make you go, whoa, this movie's going to be fun. right? That, that's done a lot more these days, start with a bang. But it's also, uh, and it might be just funny joke, 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 and you think you're watching funny joke, but what you're actually being asked to do is invest in someone's problem. And that's secretly what's going on. If you, if you go to a comedy, you think you're going for the laughs. You're not. You're being, you're being secretly asked to invest in someone's dilemma, and you stay there until they work it out. Because it's, you know, who wants to sit for 90 minutes? You have to have a reason. So you have to be kind of uh, ushered into this investment. Or it's you're usually just, learning about the character, setting up who they are, so you understand who the character is, and you like them, and you invest in them, and then throwing them into turmoil by the something like that. Something. Yeah, that's the classic way to yeah. do it. Yeah, uh, and that happens in in the eleven minute format as well. It just has to happen in the first two pages of the script. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to jump on onto a couple of quick points. So I'd just like to touch on punch up. Um, yeah, and and the joke pass. So I think for a lot of folk writing, that that in some ways almost seems to contradict you know that jokes can come at the end the the amount of the complex setup that's gone into it the how does a joke pass get in there and not upset the apple cart in terms of all the important story components that have been constructed and I assume that's kind of a very specific skill that some people are particularly good at and others not so but it's a good skill okay so if you take a script and everything works about it but it's just not funny enough you have to be very careful about the kind of surgery you do to, to punch up the comedy of it. You know, I mean, careful maybe is the wrong word, but you have to be, you have to be very thoughtful. So don't forget, you've had something that started out as your four sentences, and then you've worked it out to premise, which is a page long. It's, it's gone to the story editor. It's gone to the producers. It might be gone to the network. It's been approved. Don't fuck with it. Don't change it. You can't change it. You know, don't. Don't go rewrite. Don't don't go saying, "Ah, oh, I added an orphan." No, <laughs> you won't really advance in your writing career if you can't be relied on to deliver the product that people have approved. So then you get up to outline. Same thing. You've got a four-page outline, classically. You know, you've done your drafts on it. You've fixed all the notes, and then you write the dialogue. That that script better match that outline. Par a paragraph better be a scene. You know. You know, it better you better be able to go down like this. If you're making big changes unauthorized, someone's gonna be unhappy with that. So you really want to move it through the beast in a way that doesn't it doesn't it still looks like the same thing. And then you got to do the punch up, so the same thing applies. Exact same thing applies. Every line of that script now means something, right? Um, more or less, the goal would be to take those exact same lines that do exactly the same thing, like someone saying, "I'm not. I'm, there's no way I'm going to go with you." Right? It's a story point. It's a story point. Every line at some at this point at this stage in your script, if it's a good script, is engineered to have a story reason. It's not just a bunch of people talking around saying funny things. Everything is moving the story forward in a very specific way. You can't really change that. You, you shouldn't fuck with that. You, so when you punch up, you want to take that exact same sentence and the purpose of that sentence and then just say that same thing in a funny way. Like instead of saying, I don't want to do that, you say, I would rather drink a cup of bees. You know, you, fi you just find an alternate that has, and then when you're doing that, so think of a way, you know, or, or, you, or if you want to put a character spin on it, you know, uh, you, it would be like, I would rather spend a, a, a night in a tent with him. You know, if you know that these, that you know, that someone's particularly, you know, has poor hygiene or something, and that's one of their things, then you, you could be like, I would rather trade socks with Joe. You know, so, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You, you, can, you can add some character to it. You've still said exactly the same thing. I don't want to do it, right? But you found a... You found a colorful, funny way to do it. Now, our, our particular uh, one one particular technique that we find useful in baboon animation in our writing group is to try to do that visually, like drinking a cup of bees. It popped a funny picture. Me as a writer, I can't draw funny things. It's not my job, but I can put funny pictures in your head anyway, and it's a much richer way. You know, to, so when you when you think of comedy punch up, it's fun to think of. 
how do I put a ridiculous image in your head? A very, a very silly, you know, mm. image. Is, is punch up also? Is there an is, not just about joke parts, but is that also an opportunity to refine the story a bit like what, what you were just talking about earlier about where in that first 15 minutes... Yeah, not comedy punch-up. Tighten, punch up. tighten that as well, and tight, if there's anything in there that happened, you go, hold on, this is almost an opportunity here to just sell another point on this character and pull it back to so you understand. I don't think you're usually at that point selling another point, but well, no, I think selling, you are... Sorry, selling an existing point. Selling an existing point better, yeah. And that's not a comedy punch, that's just a... That's just an amplifier. Does that happen in punch ups? Absolutely. You're tightening that, that aspect of it as well. Oh, yeah, that happens a lot where you get to a, a point and the, the person hasn't re. Like, because it's, it's fun. Like, like that example of like, there's no way I'm getting in that car, right? Then you find the funny way to say it. Like, I, I, you know, I'd rather eat his underwear, right? Um, but then you immediately cut to he's in the car with him. You know, you like. Mm -hmm. and, you, you've, you've, like at first, maybe that line was like, I don't really think we should do this. But someone said, you know, this turn would be funnier. Or, and, the, or, and the story would have, and also that'll give him more potential later when he's like, he's there basically, like maybe he's tied up in the front seat of the car. Like maybe they've tied him up so he has no choice, which is funny. Like, you know, there's no way in hell you're ever going to get me to do that. Then boom, you know, they've, They've done. They've tied him up in some funny way, you know. Maybe with his own. Maybe he's a gardener. And he's got a hose with him, right? It's like there's no way you're. I'm gonna get in the truck with him. Suddenly he's tied in his own hose, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe he's just in there, and it's a really easy. Just eating an ice cream, like I just gave him something really, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they give him a great big ice cream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. If it, especially if that's a character thing, yeah. he's just like he can't resist sweets. Yeah. Right. So and with animation, you do have the added advantage, I suppose, of Punch-Up Stage 2, of including those visuals and also, you know, off-screen voices, things like that, mm. sound effects, etc. Again, I suppose that comes back possibly to the animation writer being aware that there's that uh, sort of chest of tools that can come in if that line can't be changed but something funny has to happen. That's right. Good God. It's telling me it's <laughs> 8 o'clock. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I thought I turned it off. Hey, I just wanted to touch on one last thing. Uh, you've recently been doing a graphic uh, novel, which you've written and illustrated. Written, quite a part of. Wrote and and um, was a co-director of the of the illustration team. Yeah. So yeah. Laid, I laid out half of the. I did um, the. I guess you would call it laying out the pages oh for half, God, half of the book. <laughs> God, so, I don't believe this is happening. Here we go. Off. Okay. Right. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's a graphic novel of... Um, um, I, w I was asked to write um, a what, what became an iPad graphic novel and yep. an animated interactive graphic novel, but now it's coming out in print finally, which is, which is really cool. I mean, it's really fun on the iPad. It's called Operation Ajax. Oh, yeah? I think we've got a graphic of that as well. Oh, no. Yeah, please just uh, share a little bit about. Uh, so it's a, well. uh, it's, yeah, my first published book. Oh, that looks nice. Um, it's just coming out in the next couple of weeks. It's the story of the CIA's first coup. So the CIA started out as a spy agency, and then it, at some point it became a, a an instrument of uh, world rearrangement. So, I mean, we've done many, many coups. It, it, this is the first attempt. It went so well that the government is like, wow, the CIA is pretty damn handy. So this is the story about how it evolved from a spy agency into a, a coup agency. And it happens to be the, uh, the story of the overthrow of the, of the representational democracy, the two-house parliament democracy of Iran which we overthrew in 1953 just because we could no because the, because of the oil basically i mean it's it's no secret we we teamed with the british uh we teamed basically with the british petroleum uh bp which was called the anglo-iranian oil company at the time uh they changed their name right after this coup by the way sort of as a pr move they're like we're british petroleum now we're no longer iranian at all uh, this was this was their prime minister, the big bald guy, and uh, 
he had decided to uh, that that Iran's oil is Iran's oil, and he nationalized the oil because the Brits weren't sharing at all; they were just taking all of it except a pittance. So he said, "No, if you don't want fifty-fifty, guess what? You get zero percent, we get a hundred. So, so the British government and British Petroleum came to the U.S. and we and made arrangements to take over the government um, through." Very foul and and uh, cinematically exciting means. <laughs> I was going to say I'm assuming not every line's um, funny in that. Not every line's funny, no. Um, oh, I did want to ask you in that it's, it's an incredible uh, book, beautiful, beautiful illustration thank you, as well. Thank you. And as you're seeing a bit more of the um, graphic novel sort of style work moving into animation as well, and you were you were saying it's a very different experience from a writer's perspective working in a graphic novel format to what you were used to with animation? Well, we wrote it kind of like a movie script, yep. and then it was, it was bored, it was, uh, you know, broken out into story, into, it was, you know, it was broken out much like a storyboard. No, I don't think it was that much different in that respect. What was, what was tricky was taking as a historical incident with so many players in it and finding a protagonist with a point of view that would take you through the story. That an audience that the likely audience for graphic novels would actually care about. You know, it's not like a lot of, you know, aging Iranian men are reading comic books, right? <laughs> Otherwise, they'd all be like, yeah, that's my perfect protagonist, you know? It, so it, it wasn't a natural fit. It was really, really hard to find the character point of view on the story. In the end, we took, the, uh, you know, he actually doesn't appear in the poster, but this is all told through, through the point of view of a young CIA agent, a junior CIA agent, who we reconstructed from, we, we got some secret leaked documents, which since have been declassified, but at the time were secret, that uh, we, we acquired. And we, we, um, we constituted what we could as a portrait of some of the team members. You know, and there's there's men, there's many there's a few different accounts, and everyone uses code names. So you have to really read several texts to figure out exactly who was who and whose role was what in the coup. But pretty much, we we pieced together the original coup team, which was something like eight people, um, in terms of the boots on the ground, the eight spies that went in and 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 ran the operation. So we kind of invented uh, a ninth, and he was the youngest member. And what would it be like if you were new to this organization and, and asked to do what you thought was a noble cause that was supposed to save the U.S. from the Soviets? Because the Soviets, the, the story they painted was that the Soviets were going to take over Iran if we didn't, right? And that's what they told uh, the rank and file in the CIA organization. And once you, once, we, once you got there, the story inside was very different. So we figured, let's tell it from the point of view of a young spy that once he gets there, he goes holy shit, I've been lied to, but I have to do this or I won't get out alive. That's a pretty compelling story. And it took us a while to hit on that kid and, and you know, hit on using that kid and, and, and giving him that point of view. But suddenly we had a strong di di dilemma. So a lot of that, again, following sort of classic pattern, you would put into a script, really, just a different way of telling the story finally. Yeah, the and then, the, sure, a graphic it. novel is, plays very yeah. close to a movie in that regard, but none of it can happen until you have someone's point of view. Yeah, yeah. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm really sorry we're going to have to wrap it up and uh, head for drinks, but could you please thank Mike Thank you. Uh, Thanks. 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 Thank you. I, I think we're about to head out for a drink and to hopefully get to meet people as well. Yeah. yeah. It's been great. Thank you, Mike. Cool. No, thank you very much. Cheers.